Praise the Lord. All right, so as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study. We thank you because of your presence there. Lord Jesus, we bless your name because of the fulfillment of your promise. That where two or three or many are gathered in your name, you are there in their midst. I will thank you tonight because we know you are here with us. And we're going to study the word with the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And we pray, Lord, that this word will enrich our lives, even for this year in Jesus' name. Amen. And the grace to be obedient to your word, your grant to every one of us, so that, Lord, will move forward in the things of the Lord this year in Jesus' name. Amen. Be glorified in every life, Lord, and reveal your mind and your truth and your will to us so that we'll be able to do and live the way you want us to live. We give all the glory to you and we pray that our lives every day will be glorifying you. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We can have our seats. Tonight we're starting a new series of Bible studies And this new series you'll find in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7 That's what we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount And this Sermon on the Mount that we're starting tonight Tonight actually is an introductory study But even though it is introductory, there's a lot for every one of us to get, to gain, to learn from these verses we're looking at today. Matthew chapter 5, please open your Bible with me to verses 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them. That word there, he taught them. The word teach. Before you can have a teacher, there will be learners. And so you find all these multitudes that came to learn. And you will see the topic we're dealing with, learning to grow in his presence. The first word, learning, studying, being instructed. Looking into the word of God and receiving inspiration and instruction from the word of God. Learning. There's a purpose for learning. We're not just learning to stuff our heads with Bible instruction. We're learning, it says, to grow. We're learning to grow. There is a purpose, there is a reason why we learn. And it is to grow. And where do we grow? It says, in his presence. You come to the presence of the Lord. And then you are very conscious of that presence. And from the presence comes his power. And then it flows into your life. And as you put yourself in the posture, the attitude of learning in his presence, that's when the growth will come. That's what learn. And the reason why we learn, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Chapter 31 rather. Deuteronomy chapter 31. And I'm reading to you from verse 12. And then verse 13. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 12. Gather the people together, men, women, and children. Let's stop there for a moment. Who are the people that should learn? Who are the people that should study? Who are the people that should have a Bible study together? It says, you gather the people together. They are the people. Who are the people? What constitutes the people? The men the women, and the children. Do you see there, God expected that fathers and mothers and their children will be together in the same congregation, in the same Bible class, in the same Bible study session, and then we learn together. And then it says, and thy stranger that is within thy gates. What it means is, you may have people living with you, and they are not your biological children. You might call them helpers. You might call them servants. You might call them maids. You might call them workers. You have a factory. You have a corporation. And there are people working with you. They're those other people. They are not your biological children. You gather all of them together. And you come to the Bible study together. You have a school. 
And those children in the school, they are not your biological children, but you are in control of their lives. And you gather them together, and we have the Bible study together. Or it is that you have all the people that are dependents and co-tenants, and they listen to you. They listen to you in other areas of life. Why not bring them to the Bible study? You gather the people together, the men and the women and the children, and a stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear. And that they may learn, that they may hear, and they may learn. You gather them into the presence of God, and they hear the word of God, and we learn the word of God together. That they may learn and fear the Lord your God to observe to do, to observe to do all the words of this law. The purpose is to do it. So that they'll be able to do and practice the word of God. And their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn. What do you learn from that? You take it here, the Bible study. And then your little children that will not understand the English that we're speaking. Or the, speed, or the speed at which the preacher is preaching because they're very, very young. You go back home and you break the word down in bits and pieces for your children and you let them learn what you have learned as well. That they hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as ye live in the land whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. When do we stop learning? As long as you live. As long as you live. When do we start coming to the Bible study? As long as you live. You hear the Bible study and you learn from the word of God. Isaiah chapter 29. In Isaiah chapter 29, I'm reading from verse 24. Isaiah 29, reading from verse 24. They also that erred in spirit shall come to understand and they that murmured shall learn doctrine you see he's talking about those of us who have been ignorant of the mind of god ignorant of the will of god and the people that erred in spirit were went astray how do we get corrected and come into rectitude, into uprightness, into righteousness? We come to learn and we come to understanding. And then it says, and they that murmured, they murmured ignorantly against the way of the Lord, against the wisdom of God, and against the word of God. Now we come to learn and we come to learn doctrine in Second Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 5, verse 6, and verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 3, reading from verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. It's telling us that we're not just to learn the superficial facts about the Bible. We must not just be people that have a form of doctrine, denying the power thereof. For of such of their sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse laws, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever learning is a possibility. Of just learning and learning and learning. And yet never able to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Yes, the possibility is there. We're just showing these people here. That as for coming to the study, they come. As for listening, they listen. As for learning, they learn. But they are never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Which means then there's something more than just sitting down. It's something more than just opening the Bible to learn the word of God. In fact, we are told in Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, I'm reading to you from verse 27. Acts 13, 27. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. You see this verse says, these people are Jerusalem. 
In fact, he's talking about the capital city of their nation. As for reading the Bible, they read the Bible. And they read it every Sabbath day. And they came together once a week. And they read it. But they never understood the voices of the prophets that they heard. Never did they understand the implication and the application of the word of God. If we are to benefit then, it's going to take something from you and from me. As we study the word of God, what does it take? What are the conditions for learning? Learning to grow. Learning to grow in his presence. What conditions do we fulfill? Number one, ardent love for the truth. If you're going to benefit from the study of the word of God, you come, yes, that's important. You open your Bible, that's important. You learn, you listen, that's important. But then you have ardent love for the truth. You so love the truth that there's nothing that is so important to you but the truth of the word of God. Number two, supreme love for God. Supreme love for God. You love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And you want to receive everything the Lord has for you. Number three, intense desire to know more of him. Intense desire. A burning desire within you to know more of him. I just want to know more. I want to know more. More of Christ. More of God. More of the Holy Spirit. More of the will of God. The word of God for me. That ardent desire. Intense desire to know more. Will actually make you to learn much more. Number four. Willingness to make any personal sacrifice. In order to learn and to grow. That's what it takes. If we're going to get the best from the learning of the word of God. There must be the willingness within us. To make any personal sacrifice in order to learn and to grow. Are there things that may preoccupy your mind that will make you miss what the Lord is telling you? You sacrifice those things. Are there some preoccupations? Are there some thoughts? Are there some desires? Are there some practices that will block the way of the flow of the knowledge of the word of God into your spirit, into your mind? You sacrifice them. The willingness to make any personal sacrifice in order to learn and to grow. Number five, the commitment to practice as fast as you learn. The commitment to practice what you learn as fast as you learn it. You hear it now, immediately you, you practice it. And look at our children at home, I mean those infants and those toddlers. How do they learn to speak? Immediately they hear something from daddy and mommy, they try to uh, verbalize it, they, not, they try to pronounce it immediately. Uh, that's how they learn. If they see their elder, senior brother, the siblings doing something in the family and they have not really learned how to do them. And then they make an attempt immediately. It is that commitment to practice as fast as you learn. That's how you are going to grow. Number six, a fixed purpose of heart to know and to do the whole truth. Not choosing, sifting, selecting, accepting this, rejecting that. A fixed purpose of heart to know and to do the whole will. Then number seven, a state of mind that will not be diverted to make provision for the flesh. A state of mind that will not be diverted to make provision for the flesh. Yes, I know that's what well and but I know that's what the Bible says, but every time you do like that, you are making provision for the flesh. And you are saying, yes, I know that's the truth. I know that's the doctrine. I know that's the revelation of the word of God. But the but is to make provision for the flesh. But I am weak. But I cannot do it. But not everybody is obedient. But everybody is not like that. But making provision for the flesh. If you're going to learn and you are going to grow, there will be that state of mind that will not be diverted to make any provision for the flesh. Let's come back now to the real passage we are looking at today. Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 and 2. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. When they saw the multitudes, the question is, where did these multitudes come from? How were these multitudes gathered together? Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. 
The Lord Jesus Christ in earlier chapter, this chapter 4, he had gone about to this city and to that location and to that place, teaching the word of God and healing the people that were sick. And his fame went throughout all Syria. What does that mean? They started talking about it. I, I've seen something. I heard somebody. I've heard what I never heard before. And I got a miracle I never got before. All the healings that took place, they were telling one another. That's what we call publicity. If the Lord has done anything for you, you talk about it to other people. Did you attend the crusade last year in May and August and October as well as November? And did the Lord do something for you or for your neighbor or for the people that you brought? You go about, you talk about it. It's as they talked about what the Lord had done. That's when people were gathering together. His fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those that were possessed with devils, and those that were lunatic, and those that had the pulse, and he healed them, and there followed him great multitudes of people. They have followed him great multitudes of people. The people that got healed in those crusades. That Jesus Christ had. The people that got touched or transformed in those open air meetings that Jesus Christ had, they said, Wait, if you can have this in just a week of being in our city, we can have more. Therefore, they followed him. Isn't it surprising that many people that come to crusades, they get the healing, they get the deliverance, and then they don't want Bible study? That's strange. And that's different because you see the people in the time of Jesus Christ, when they got healed, that's why they followed him from everywhere. That's how the crowd gathered. And I want to encourage you this year, as the Lord has blessed you, as the Lord has healed you, as the Lord has delivered you, and the Lord has had some impact or power in your life, then you leave what you're doing on a Bible study like this. We have it every Monday. We start at 6 o'clock, and the teaching actually starts by 7 o'clock. That's for the time of Nigeria here. All of you in the other countries, you know the time you start. And we, we all link together, and we hear the word of God. And the people have been touched over there and transformed over there, and he delivered over there and healed over there. We we all pull together on Monday night like this to study the word of God, verse 25. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and, and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from John from and from beyond Jordan and seeing the multitudes. That's how they gather together. And that's how we gather together here too. The Lord has touched our lives and the Lord has transformed us. The Lord has done something for us. As a result of what the Lord has done, we're coming out of gratitude. We're coming out of appreciation. See what he has done for me. I want to know more of him. I want to hear more from him. That's why we came and then it says and he went up into a mountain. And it went up into a mountain. You might find in the ministry and the life of Jesus Christ, the mention of mountain, mountain, mountain. Why do we have such mention? Well, Jesus Christ had only three and a half years for ministry. He didn't have time to build an auditorium. And the synagogues that were available, they were very, very small. Actually, you could have a synagogue with just 10 worshippers. And when you have a minimum of 10 people, almost like house fellowship, you could have synagogue worship. And many times they went to their synagogues. And when he had gone to many, many places, then there was no place that could take all the multitudes that came. He couldn't go to a particular temple or go to a particular... That's why he went to this mountainside. You are going to discover something in the Acts of the Apostles. You can read from chapter 1 all through chapter, chapter 28. You will never find one single incident when the disciples went up to the mountain and then prayed to the people. Now they had an upper room. Now they had a larger place. Now they had the open place. And they could preach the word of God. You are not going to find the mention of mountain. In any of the epistles from Romans all through to Jude, you are not going to find that any of those leaders or any of those apostles went to a mountain and then began to pray. You see, there are some religious people and they don't understand, they don't study the whole Bible. When they want to pray, they go to a mountain. Why? 
Now you have a house, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And because he has nowhere to lay his head, all the mountainside were the places available. And he went to the places that were available. And so don't just copy something and say, Jesus went to the mountain to pray. I'm going to the mountain. He, he, he didn't tell go to him. He said, when you want to pray, go into your closet. He didn't have a closet. He didn't have a building. Go into your closet. And when you have shut the door, that's what he said. He didn't tell to go to the mountain and then pray to your father, which is in heaven. And so as students of the Bible, the people that really want to follow the word of God, you read with understanding. Well then, these people now gathered and they were by all these mountainside and they were told that when he was saved, his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them. He opened his mouth and taught them. I pray the Lord will teach us. Amen. Disciples, uh, the word disciple means learner. And then he taught them. Why did he teach them? Number one, he wanted them to become associates. Number two, he wanted them to become ambassadors. Number three, he wanted them to become apostles. Now he brought all these people together and teaching them and teaching them. You see, when I talk to you, and you talk back to me, and we understand one another, the more we understand one another, the more we associate with one another more. Number one, he taught them, these disciples, that they might become associates. Number two, that they might become ambassadors of Christ. They take the word from his mouth, and then they take that word unto other people, and then, number three, they become the saint one, they become apostles. We're dividing the message tonight to three parts. Number one, Learning in his presence. Learning in his presence. Number two, leaning on his promise. Leaning on his promise. Number three, living by his precepts. Let's come back to number one. We're now learning in his presence. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And seeing the multitudes, they went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Have you noticed something? There is an inseparable connection between the teacher and the learner. What if I came here tonight and there was no congregation? I'll just read the Bible to myself. I will not teach. What if you came here tonight and there was no teacher? You just sit down there and there will be no communication of the message. For us to have a learning situation, you have the teacher, you have the audience, you have the congregation, you have the learners. And it is the understanding and the connection between the teacher and the learners that will provide a learning situation and a learning privilege. And so we find uh, verse 1, the multitudes came together, the students were there. The disciples were there. The learners were there. And then the teacher now also came and he taught them. What kind of teacher was the Lord Jesus Christ? In John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're looking at it from verse 2. John chapter 3 verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi. That means master. That means teacher. Rabbi. We know that thou art a teacher come from God. We know that what a teacher come from God. As you look at the Lord Jesus Christ going from city to city and then healing the sick, what would you call him? You say that's an evangelist. That's true. As you look at Jesus Christ gathering the people together and preaching unto them, declaring to them the mind of God. What do you call You say that's a preacher, that's a pastor. That's true. That tells you something now. An evangelist must be a teacher. Because, you see, you have to teach the people faith. You have to teach the people about the Savior. You have to teach the people about believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And a person cannot just say, I'm an evangelist, and you will not teach in a very systematic way. You will still teach the people. If you are going to be a pastor, a preacher, you must teach. There is an element of teaching in the pastoral ministry. And you cannot just say, well, I'm a pastor, therefore I don't teach. You must teach. Look at Jesus Christ, the great shepherd. That's a great pastor. And he taught the people. And that's why Nicodemus said, we know we have been watching you. And now we have made our conclusion about you. We know you are a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. 
Now you, you understand that Jesus Christ, when he taught, he actually taught the way of God. As you look at Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, see two or three things there in the verse 16. Matthew chapter 22, verse 16. Here we learn, and they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true. That's number one. And teachest the way of God in truth. That's number two. And neither carest thou for any man. That's number three. For thou regardest not the person of men. That's number four. As you look at Jesus Christ as a great teacher, as the model teacher, as a perfect teacher, as, as a teacher that sets the pattern and the example for us. Here is what we learn about him. Number one, we know that you are true. There's nothing funny about you, nothing fake about you, nothing like counterfeit about you, nothing like hypocrisy about you. What you are on the inside is what you see on the outside. Through and through, whether it's your word, or whether it is your utterance, or whether it is your lifestyle, or whether it is your interaction, whether it is private or public, we know that you are true. And can anybody really have the privilege of teaching the word of God if it's not true? If it's false? It's false to himself. He deceives himself. He is not sincere. Is false to the word of God. Is false to the almighty God who has sent us. Can he really teach with confidence? Can he really teach expecting a reward from the Lord when he's false to himself and false to the Bible and false to God? We know thou art true. If you're going to be a teacher after the pattern, after the model of the Lord Jesus Christ, you must be true. Number two in that verse 16, it says, and teaches the way of God in truth. If you're going to be a teacher that will be profitable to anybody, profitable to the congregation, and profitable to yourself, you must teach the way of God, not the way of man, not the way of man. And they recognize it because the Pharisees taught the way of men. The Sadducees taught the way of men. Tradition is what they taught. And even though they were teaching all that tradition, the people were still flocking there. They were still going there, deceiving the people. But concerning Jesus Christ, we know that you are teaching the way of God. And when you teach, can you say that? You are teaching the house fellowship. Can you say everything you are teaching? There's no way of man. It's not psychology. And it is not the way of man. It's not tradition. Whether you are talking about marriage, or you are talking about child bearing, child naming ceremony, or you are talking about interaction with one another, or you are talking about setting up a corporation or a kind of job, or whether you are talking about the way you work and the money you earn, whether you are talking about our interaction, anything you are teaching, you are teaching the way of God. Anytime, whether in the private or in the public, or do you add the ideas of men? Or do you add the traditions of men? Or do you add, well, this is not in the Bible, but I feel. Do you add your feeling? But you know, they said about Jesus Christ, we know you're teaching the way of God. And you teach it in truth. You teach it in truth. There are people that hold the truth of God in righteousness, but not Jesus Christ. And that's the example we ought to follow. That uh, you believe the Lord is raising you up as a teacher. The Lord is raising you up as a pastor. The Lord is raising you up as a gospel proclaimer. Then you must be true, number one. Number two, you must teach the way of God in truth. Number three, thou carest not for any man. What it means is, you are not looking at the faces of the people. And you are not saying, this one will not receive it. This one will not accept it. This one, uh, uh, these people, they don't want the teaching, the instruction. They want some emotional uplift. And they want some emotional excitement. And so let me give them what they want. Not what they want. But what the Lord wants to give to them to save their soul. And to deliver them from all the darkness and all the oppression and all the condemnation that they have. You don't care, neither do you care for any man, nor regardeth, it says, nor regardeth the person of man. That's how to teach. That you are teaching without fear and without favor. You are teaching the word of God and you are teaching that word in truth. What kind of teacher will draw you close to God? What kind of teacher can link you with God and channel your faith to God? 
but except a teacher that has come from God. And that's what we learn about Jesus Christ. He came from God because he was teachable before the Father. Likewise, we cannot be effective teachers unless we're teachable ourselves. Christ taught, the Lord Jesus taught so much in those three and a half years of ministry because he did not limit his teaching to just one day a week. One day a week. Hey, can I just show you the teaching pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ? Number one, he taught every day. He taught every day. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 55. Matthew chapter 26, verse 55. In that same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves? For to take me, I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple. And ye laid no hand, no hold on me. I sat daily, daily with you, teaching in the temple. The Lord is saying, go and do thou likewise. You can teach every day. We don't have to come here to this building for you to teach every day. There are people in your community, gather them together. And there are people in your neighborhood, gather them together. It doesn't have to be on Monday. It doesn't have to be on Tuesday. Get them together. There are people where you are walking during the lunch hour break. Gather them together. And you can do that every day. Every day. You can teach every day. Everybody may not come every day. You can have a Bible study. This same outline in your hand. Raise up your hand. Let me see you. Thank you, God bless. You can take that outline in your hand, and tomorrow uh, at the break hour, gather some people. To, they don't have to be 2,000. They can just be two, or they can be five. And then everything you have learned here, you teach. And then on Wednesday, it doesn't have to be those same two people, five people, ten people. You can go to another place and teach. And then on Thursday, you can gather another, another group of people together in your neighborhood, in your place of work, anywhere you are. And you can also say like Jesus Christ, I sat with you teaching every day. We can do it and we're going to do it. And then look at John chapter 8. He taught every day number two. He taught early in the morning. Early in the morning. We're looking at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. We're looking at verse 2. In John chapter 8 verse 2. And early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. And the Lord is saying, go and do thou likewise. Oh, you say we cannot do that today because everybody has gone to the place of work. No, sir. No, sir. It doesn't happen that way. There are people that are doing a cheat. In fact, there are people, they want to come to this Bible study now, but they cannot come. They want to come. And why can't they come? Because they go and shift uh, night work. And they're going to close about 5 o'clock in the morning. And when they close about 5 o'clock in the morning, are there people here that can have a commitment that like of Jesus Christ? And early in the morning, before they now maybe go to rest or go any other place, gather them together. I'm sure you wanted to go to the Bible study last night. But because you are night shift and night duty, you could not be there. Here is your opportunity. I'm available for you. All of us are doing night duty in this community. Let us come together. And we have Bible study at 6 o'clock o'clock in the morning. Bible study at 7 o'clock in the morning. We're following the pattern of Jesus Christ. We do that in our retreats. I, you know, take you in the faith clinic 6 o'clock in the morning in the Congress or whatever. I take you 6.30 in the morning. You can do it too. We are following the pattern of Jesus and you can gather people around early in the morning like he taught the word of God. You teach the word of God as well. Then he taught in the temple, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 23. Matthew 21 verse 23. It says, and when he was come into the temple, into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching, as he was teaching in the temple, in the temple. If you, can, you can use your local church, the district church, anywhere you can, and you can use it. You can use your house. You remember the time when Jesus was teaching the house and they brought a paralytic man and they went to the roof to take away a tile so as to lower the man. They used the house. He also used the, the temple. He used the synagogue. He used everywhere. Any place you have, any place that's available, you can open up and then use and teach the people. Number four, he even taught on the street when there was no building, when there was no accommodation. 
And where there was no temple or synagogue, he used the street. We're looking at uh, Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 26. Luke chapter 13, verse 26. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. Plural, in our streets. You know, Jesus will take the word of God to this street, and right at the street corner there, people gather together, he'll teach them. The following day, he'll go to another street and teach them. The following day, he'll go to another street and teach them. And Jesus is a perfect example. We don't have to wait until we have a building like this, a sanctuary like that, before we can teach. You can go to your neighborhood on the street corner there, teach the word of God, and then get people to know the Lord. The important thing is to create a learning situation. And that's what Jesus Christ did every time, everywhere that he went. He even taught on the sea. Can you imagine that? Man, in Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. In Luke chapter 5 verse 1, and it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, and the fishermen were gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. And then it says, and he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's. And prayed him that he would thrust a little into from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the sheep. What if, you know, you are by the riverside and that's all you have. And that's all the space you have. And the people are gathered there. Do you understand now the people that thought that every time Jesus wanted to do something spiritual, he went to the mountain. Not always on the mountain. Sometimes in the temple. Sometimes in the synagogue. Sometimes it's in the house. Sometimes on the sea. And sometimes in the desert. Everywhere and anywhere. And the Lord is saying, go and do likewise. You cannot say, well, it's because there's no cathedral. That's why I couldn't teach. I had a lot of things to teach. I'm full of material. I'm full of matter. But you see, there, there's no temple for me to use about the street. I about the seaside. I about your community. I about under that shade of that tree there. Of course, you can if you want to. If you want to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. He even did it in the desert place. In Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, verses 32 to 34. Mark chapter 6, from verse 32. And they departed into a desert place by sheep privately. And the people saw them departing. And many knew him and ran a foot thither out of all the cities and outwent them and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, so much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were a sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them. Them many things in the desert place too. In the desert place, even when there was no shade or whatever, he just taught the people, and then he taught them anywhere. People gathered together, wherever it was. The people gathered together. John chapter eighteen, verse twenty. John eighteen, reading from verse twenty. In John eighteen, verse twenty, Jesus answered him. I speak openly to the world and ever taught in the synagogue, in the temple, whither the, the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. Anywhere the people resorted together, gathered together, I was available to teach. Now you should do likewise. In fact, we are told in Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 37. Luke chapter 10, the latter part of verse 37. Go and do thou likewise. You say Jesus is your Lord, go and do thou likewise. You say you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Go and do thou likewise. The Lord wants us to actually follow him and follow his example and be a teacher, a teacher of the word. And as we follow him, we'll bear fruit in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 11 verse 29. Matthew chapter 11 verse 29. In Matthew 11, 
reading from verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Find out how I taught, who I taught, where I taught, and follow that example. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4. Isaiah chapter 50, reading from verse 4. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. And as the Lord teaches us, then we'll be able to teach others also in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you look at the way Jesus taught, how did he teach? He taught, number one, without fear and without favor. And remember, there's an inseparable connection between the learner and the uh, teacher. Learners and teachers are inseparably connected together. And one cannot function without the other. And if Jesus taught without fear, without favor, then you ought to learn without fear, without favor. That means to take in the whole word of God and you are not afraid I might learn something that I will not be able to digest. Nothing like that. He taught without fear, without favor. You too will learn without fear, without favor. Number two, he taught with focus and freshness. And that's how you have to learn too. You see, if, uh, the, if the teacher is focused, but the students or the learners are diverted, there will be no connection. The connection comes when the teacher is focused and fresh, and the learners are focused and fresh. And then number three, taught with firmness and finality. You have heard it had been said, this, 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 but I say unto you, that was firm and final. And then number four, he taught with faith and forbearance. How do you learn? You learn with faith. You learn with faith. You are taking, Lord, I believe you. Lord, I accept you. Lord, I accept your word. Everything you are teaching me, I know. You are going to live big within me and make me to be able to do what you are calling me to do. Number five, he, he taught freely and fully. He taught everything full. He didn't subtract anything, take anything away. The same thing, that's the way you learn. You learn fully and freely. Number six, he taught frequently and fervently. And that's how you learn. You learn frequently. You know? And then all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, everything is concentrating on the word. And then he taught faithfully and fearlessly. That's how you learn too. You learn faithfully. I come now to point number two. We're back in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading verses 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And seeing the multitudes, they went up into a mountain and then when he was set his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them and taught them as you look at what jesus christ taught here you will see that it requires leaning upon the promise of the lord to be able to carry out what he taught for let me just show you a few of them hey, look at verse um, verse 11 and verse 12 blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceedingly glad when you are persecuted when you are beaten rejoice don't cry you are going to depend upon his promise before you can do that if you don't have the promise of the lord and the power of the lord there's no way you can rejoice when you're persecuted what jesus christ taught will demand that he fulfills his promise with his power in your life before you'll be able to practice it please turn to uh, chapter 5 reading from verse 22 but i say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judge and whosoever shall say to his brother Reka shall be in danger of the council, and whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. The teaching there is don't get angry and don't say thou fool. And to be able to do that, you need to depend upon the promise of God. Because you know people will do things that will provoke you, will have the tendency of making you angry. Jesus said, don't get angry and don't call people fool. How am I going to do that? That's why we say, if you're going to obey the Lord, you will have to rely and depend upon the promise 
of God. Verse 25, agree with thine adversary quickly. Whilst thou art in the way, what's in? How are you going to obey that? Because when somebody is your enemy and your adversary, the tendency for every human being is to withdraw. Is to turn your face to the other side. Is to keep malice. Is to, I will not greet you. And you must not greet me. I don't want anything to do. Vanish away and get, just fade into the sin here. I don't want to see your face. That's the normal attitude of people when they're offended. And yet Jesus said, come together. Agree with one another with your adversary. Are you going to do that? That takes the grace of God. That's why you need to rely on his promise and his power. If you're going to carry out the word of God, I'm reading from verse 28, but I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery without already in his heart. What a teaching. If you're going to carry that one out, don't you need the power of God and the grace of God and the promise of God? And you go and ask the average man, you know, as they go about if they are not born again they are lost in their hearts every time after women and Jesus said even if you don't commit the real act if you lost after women in your heart you have committed adultery already if you die in that condition you are judged as an adulterer you say who then can live a righteous life that's why you depend upon the grace of the Lord relying or leaning on his promise that's what he's telling us as you look at it verse 38 verse 38 you have heard that it had been said, an eye for an eye, and it's tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the, on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. You say, impossible, impossible. They smite me on the one cheek. If I don't reply them and don't retaliate, I don't slap them back, that will be great achievement for me. But to even stay there and allow him to abuse me, insult me again, and slap me again, that's why I said, if you're going to carry out the word of God, you rely on the promise of God. You lean upon the promise of God. You see, what Jesus taught will take grace in your heart before you obey him will take the supernatural power of God in your life before you can obey. And that's what he's teaching. And nothing less than the real power of God in our lives can make us do what, it, what he has taught us here to do. And we're going to do it. Because we know his grace is sufficient for us and we will be able to in Jesus' name. Ezekiel chapter 36. The grace and the strength and the promise to be able to carry out what he's teaching us. Ezekiel chapter 36. I'm reading from verse 25. Ezekiel 36. Reading from verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your, from your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. I, I, a new heart will I give you A new spirit will I put within you And I will take away the stony heart Out of your flesh And I will give you an heart of flesh And I will put my spirit within you And cause you to walk And make you to walk And influence you to walk In my statutes And ye shall, and ye shall keep my judgments And do them He said I'm the one to help you I will so help you, you will be able to do the will of God. Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. I am reading from verse 12. Isaiah 26. Reading from verse 12. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us. For thou also hast wrought all our works in us. Not by your strength. Thou hast wrought all our works in us. You see, that's why we rely on the promise of the Lord. So that the teaching of the word of God will then become very easy for us. Because it lives within us to carry out what he's teaching us. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. Philippians 2 verse 13. For it is God which walketh in you, both to will and to do. It is God which walketh in you, both to will and to do, of his good pleasure. 
in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter chapter 1 rather. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God will count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. He is the one that will fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see what the Lord is telling us when the Lord gives us a commandment. He has the power, he has the strength to make us do what he has called us us to do. Actually, that's the difference between the Lord Jesus Christ and the other teachers like Moses, like Daniel, like David. They could teach the word of God, uh, but they couldn't make the people listening to them to do it. But Christ had the power to teach and to transform his hearers. You know, he has the power, he has the knowledge to teach healing. He also has the power to heal the people. He has the knowledge to teach forgiveness. And then he actually has the power to forgive. He has the power to teach about peace. Be at peace with one another. And he has the power to give that peace unto you. He has the power to proclaim, go and sin no more. And then before you go, he gives you the power actually to go and sin no more. It's not just a teacher that will teach you, do this and say, how am I going to do it? Well, go and try your best. That's I declare to you the truth and the word of God. But you see, when he tells you, go and sin no more, he gives you the power to go and sin no more. He has the knowledge to teach you holiness. And yet, he also has the power to make you holy. He has the knowledge to teach you evangelism. You're going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But he also makes you a fisher of men. Follow me now. Make you fishers of men. He has the power, the knowledge to teach. Fear not. And then he now has the power to give you that fearlessness. When he tells you fear not, he also makes you fearless. So then we understand that we need to lean and rely on him so that we can receive the power to practice what Christ has taught. And uh, we, we receive the fulfillment of his promises in our lives as we believe. We need to lean upon his promise because he's able to make us be the kind of people we ought to be. As we look at John chapter 15, John chapter 15, it tells he is the power of God in man. And because of the power that resides in him and he lives within us, then we can be and we can do what he has called us to do. In John chapter 15, John chapter 15 verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except he abide in me. I am the vine. And ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. The same bringeth forth much fruit. You abide in him and he abides in you. And then his promises become real in your life. For without me, ye can do nothing. In First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 13. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually walketh, which effectually walketh also in you that believe effectually working within us because we believe that's why paul the apostle said in philippians chapter 4 philippians chapter 4 verse 13 i can do all things through christ which strengtheneth me when the lord said go and do something Paul the Apostle said, that's all right, I'll do it. I can do it. When other people are crying, impossible, difficult. Nobody can hear this and do it. Nobody can accomplish this. Love your enemies. 
do good to them which despitefully use you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When your enemy hungers, feed him. Is thirsty, give him drink. Ah, uh, I don't think I can do it. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In your community, they are there. Evangelize. Do it. I'm always afraid. I cannot talk to people. I'm shy. I'm an introvert. I cannot. Paul the apostles. I can. I can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When the Lord says, give away yourself and lay everything, lay yourself on the altar of sacrifice and just give away yourself completely. I don't think I can do that. I'm, you know, always reserved about, you know, this consecration and submission. I I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Anything the Lord has commanded, rely on the promise of God and you'll find you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. In Ephesians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3, looking at verse 20. Now, unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. There's a power that works in the believer. And because of that power working in us, that also makes us to be able to do what the Lord has called us to do. Let me show you the secret of obeying the Lord. The secret of doing what the Lord has called us to do. Let, let's learn from the life of Jesus Christ in John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 10. John chapter 14, verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. Listen to this latter part. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. If it's healing, it's the Father dwelling in me that does it. If it's deliverance, it's the Father that dwells in me that does it. If it's forgiveness, it's the Father that dwells in me that does it. If it is loving with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, it's not me. It's the Father that dwells in me that does it. If it's obeying the commandment of God, it is the Father that dwells in me that does it. That's the principle of what Jesus walked. The father dwelt in him. And because of the indwelling of the father, that's why he was able to do everything he was called to do. How about you? Can you say the father dwelleth in you? Second Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them. That's all right. I will dwell in them. The Father that dwelleth in me doeth the works. And so the Father also dwells in the believer. I will dwell in them. And when God Almighty dwells in you, all things are possible. Don't ever say to yourself again, that commandment is difficult, I cannot do it. Doesn't the Father dwell in you? That standard is high, I cannot live that. Doesn't the Father dwell in you? That journey is too long. I cannot take it. Doesn't the Father dwell in you? That challenge is too much. I cannot hold on to it. Doesn't the Father dwell in you? The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So the Father says, I will dwell in them. In Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. I am reading from verse 7. 17 rather. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That's it. The Father dwells in you. If that's enough. And now on top of that, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Well, if the Father is dwelling in you, how would the God of love is dwelling within you? How would you say you cannot love his creatures, you cannot love his children? The Father, that is power, he lives within you. How would you say you don't have power to carry out what he has called you to carry out? And the power, that the, the God that dwells in you is the Holy God. Try solely, Holy, Holy, Holy God Almighty. And this Holy God is dwelling within you. How can you say that you cannot live a holy life? Because the one that lives in you is holy, you can be holy. It doesn't matter the temptation around you. Or the challenges around you. Or the dirt and the pollution of this world around you. The holy God of heaven dwells within you. And Christ. 
Almighty. The one that is first and last. The Alpha and the Omega. The one that never lost any battle. The one that cast out every devil and overcome even death itself. That Jesus Christ, he dwells inside you. How would you say you cannot live a holy, righteous life and be obedient to the word of God? Because Christ dwells in your heart by faith and you believe him and you rely upon the promise of the Lord. Then you understand that this Christ will make you, even if you are to walk on water, or climb any mountain, or go anywhere, or do anything, once the Lord has commanded you, Christ living in you, will make you to be able to do what he calls you to do. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 4, verse 14 rather, Second Timothy chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 14. In this passage, see, this is great and wonderful. It says that good thing, which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost that dwelleth in us. Have you ever thought about that? The Father dwelling in the believer, Christ dwelling in the believer, the Holy Spirit dwelling in the believer. Now, and Jesus said, the works that I do, I do by the Father that dwelleth in me. And now God dwells in you, Jesus dwells in you, and the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And you are still telling me that you cannot stop, you know, all those bad habits. And all those dirty things. And you cannot live a victorious life with the trinity dwelling inside you. You can't say that again. There's a new year. And you're going to have new strength and power to obey the Lord in Jesus name. Amen. That good thing which was committed into thy hand to keep. You keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in you. This year every one of us will be victorious in Jesus name. I come to point number three. Living by his precepts. Living by his precepts. Let's come back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're looking at verses 1 and 2. And seeing the multitude, they went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. He opened his mouth and taught them. The question is, why was he teaching them? Why are we taught the word of God? One reason, very simple, that we may obey. That we may obey. Uh, here you have, you have some students that are gathered together. And this teacher is employed to teach them. And you ask the teacher, why is it that we are teaching these young people? Simple, that they may pass the exam. And here I come to you, teach you the word of God. Why am I coming to teach you? To make you to obey the word of God. To do it. To do it. To practice it. And there'll be, there'll be no interest in teaching the word of God. If we didn't have a goal... Look at those people that play football. There's a goal post. If you remove the goal post, the game is over. If there's no goal, if there's no vision, if there's no dream, if there's no accomplishment, if there's no expectation, the game is over. And if we come to the Bible study, if we come to learn, and there is no goal and dream and vision and expectation of obeying the word of God at our land. The game is over. Let's pack our Bibles and go back home. The reason why we're teaching the word of God is so that we will obey the word of God to live by his precepts. And then we're told in that same Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 24, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, whosoever heareth and doeth them, that's the bottom line, that's the goal, that's the reason we're coming here. Have you ever thought about it, that everything I learn at every Bible study, and to go back home, immediately begin to practice and Jesus puts the blessing, not on the people that hear, but on the people that do. And it says, he that heareth these things of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended. You know, you don't know how strong a house is until the rains begin to fall. Until the winds begin to blow. Until the floors beat against that house. You don't know what you have learned until there's provocation. Until there is intimidation. Until there's temptation. 
until there are trials. You know, everybody will be a jolly good Christian when there's no temptation. Everybody will be walking on the water when there's no storm. Everybody will be living, you know, as if everything was all right when there are no temptations and trials and difficulties and challenges. It is when those challenges come, we know how strong your spiritual house is. That's why it says, He that heard these things of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a man that built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came. And the winds blew and beat upon that house. Then it says, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Standing firm. You know, sometimes you say, we have a good family. Wait until your wife offends you. That's when we know whether you have a good family or not. We have a stable family. Wait until your wife or your husband says something that you don't agree with. It's only then we know. When the winds begin to blow, all that you learn about love, all that you learn about keeping the family together, all that you learn about forgiveness and forbearance, is that's the time we know when the challenges come upon the family. And then, you, you know, you, you are in the church and here we are and say, this is my church. I love my church. I will never leave my church. Well, we'll wait until trials come. Well, wait until you are disappointed by somebody in your house fellowship, somebody in your district. Well, wait until your coordinator mistakenly steps on your toes. That's when we know whether you are consecrated or not, whether you are going to stay in the church or not. But you see, when there is no problem, when there is no problem, when there is no challenge, when there is no nothing, no misunderstanding at all, I will stand, I will worship the Lord. This is my church forever and ever. I will never leave this place. I can't believe you now. Because because, you know, the wind is not blowing yet. And the flood is not coming yet. And the challenges are not coming yet. It's when the challenges come. When the irritations come. When the contentions come. And when temptations come your way, that other people that are founded upon the rock, that they will fall. If you are still standing then, then we'll point to you and say, look at that Christian there. Your house, spiritual house, is really standing. In verse 26, and everyone that heareth these says of mine, and doeth them not. You see, it's not just coming to learn. It's not just attending the Bible study. He that heareth these things of mine and doeth them not. Here you are. Repent and believe on the gospel. You don't repent. You have not believed the gospel. Forsake all your evil ways and call upon the Lord. You have not forsaken your evil way. Hold on to the mercy of God and then you bring your gift to the altar. You remember somebody has ought against you. Leave your gift at the altar. Don't be too much in a hurry to minister and go and reconcile with your brother. Have you done it? And you give to the people that have need. Don't say come back tomorrow when you have it right in your hand. Have you done it? You see, it is the doing, it is the obedience to the word of God that makes us know that we're real children of God and we're living by the precepts of the word of God. And that's why it's telling us in that verse 26, everyone that heareth these things of mine and doeth them not, doeth them not, not what you did yesterday. I was a great Christian yesterday. I was a, you know, a generous Christian yesterday. A loving Christian, yes, that's yesterday. Doest them not today. What you live today for and what you are doing today, that's where Jesus will evaluate you and evaluate your Christian life. And then it says, Him shall be likened, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came. And the rain descended and the floods came. Look up here for a moment. You know, sometimes it's kind of a funny and um, let me use the words of Jesus, foolish. Somebody is in a church like this. We're teaching holiness and righteousness and purity and the power of God and the grace of God and gentleness and interaction, forgive one another. And then you have a challenge in your fellowship. And then you say, well, because they offended me there, I'm leaving. Did Jesus say every time they offend you in a place, leave? No. What did he tell you to do? Forgive. Go back, to, go to them. And iron it out with them. 
If they don't agree, take another person and then with them, talk over it. If he still doesn't agree, come to the church. Come to your pastor. I have so, such and such with so and so. And then he was, if he does not listen to the pastor, he's gone. Count him like a publican. You have not done that. They offend me here. And therefore, I'm quitting. Then you quit. Where you are going, they offend you there too. Because he that heareth my word and doeth it, the rain will come, the flood will come, and beat upon that house. But you to stand. While you are here, hearing the word of God, the possibility is there for you to stand. If you say, I'm leaving, over there too, there are temptations over there too. The floods will come over there too. The intimidation will come over there too. And the irritation will come over, the offense will come over there too. But unfortunately, in that other place, you cannot find them to teach you the real, sound, complete word of God. And then the house will just collapse. All the house were built up about five years of Christian life, about 10 years, 15 years of Christian life. You know, you, the, the people that shift everywhere, go and ask those farmers, you plant a tree here now, just before it bears the fruit, you uproot it and plant it here. Just before it bears fruit, you uproot it and plant it there. Just before it bears fruit, you uproot it and plant it there. You'll never bear fruit. You know, if you're in a church now, a little offense, you uproot yourself and then you go to this assembly. And then when you have a little offense, then you uproot yourself and go to this fellowship. And then when you, you know, you offend, you'll be offended everywhere. Even among the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, they offended one another. And then Jesus had to call the ten and said, don't do like that. That's what they do in the world. Don't let me see it here. He still rebuked them. And if you have been uprooted every time because of little offense and little challenge and little trial and little temptation, you'll never bear fruit. Stay where you are and say, Lord, give me the grace that I may be able to stand when these floods are coming and when these challenges are coming, that I will be able to stand and prove that actually I love the Lord and I want to serve the Lord. Come back to Matthew chapter 7 and in that verse 27, and the rain descended and the floods came. And the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I pray your spiritual house will not fall. Amen. In John chapter 8, John chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 30. John chapter 8, reading from verse 30. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my words, then are ye my disciples indeed. If ye continue in my words, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, we're reading verse 15. But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Bring forth fruit with patience. Go and ask our nursing mothers to bring up a child. It requires patience. Patience in the day and patience in the night. Patience when the child is sick and patience when the child is alive, healthy and active. Patient when the child is laughing. Patient when the child is crying. Patient when the child does not know how to do the normal thing you've taught the child to do. And patient when the child knows how to do it. Patient when the child is eager to go to school. Patient when the child is crying, I don't want to go to school. Patient with the children. That's how you train them. And that's how you bring forth fruit. You're patient with yourself. You keep on coming. Oh Lord, help me. You keep on praying. Oh Lord, help me. You keep on believing. Oh Lord, help me. You keep on listening to the word. Of, oh Lord, help me. Until he helps you to become the person you ought to be in a good heart, in a honest heart, bringing forth fruit in patience. In John chapter 14, verse 21. John chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 21. In John chapter 14, verse 21, here is what it reads. He that has my commandments and keepeth them. He that has my commandments and keepeth them. He it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. Then we're told in James chapter 1. James chapter 1. 
reading from verse 21, James 1, verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engraved word which is able to save your souls. Receive with meekness. That's how to receive the word of God. This year, as you keep on coming to the Bible study, I'm sure you'll keep coming. As you keep on coming to the Bible, so you receive the word of God with meekness. And you know, it's unfortunate if a child goes to the class and this child is saying maybe GS1 or GS2. And the teacher has already gone to university, has already a graduate, has studied education, everything. And then the teacher comes to the class. And this a child, maybe because he knows a little bit more than, you know, the other classmates, and has been trying to solve some problems for them. And then he comes to the class, and the teacher comes in, and he comes with a high mind, with conceit, and with self-deception, and with pride. That will not be right. When the student comes to the class, he comes with meekness, ready to learn. And that's what the Lord is telling us this year. Whatever happens in the office, whatever happens at home, whatever happens outside there, you come to the class, you come to the Bible study with meekness, with humility, with readiness to learn. And you don't have any other objective. You don't have any other plan, any other goal. All you have is that I'm coming to the Bible study today. Lord, speak to me. I want to learn something. I want something from you. That's why it says in that verse 21, verse 21, it tells us, wherefore you lay aside, you lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. You know, there are even people that will, it's like they're almost bragging with it. And I say, well, I know I'm naughty. How can you say that as a Christian? I know I'm strong minded. How can you say that as a Christian? I know I'm difficult to live with. How can you say that as a Christian? It says you lay all that aside. When you lay all that aside, then you lay aside the superfluity that's a surplus. It's like excess of naughtiness. And then you receive with the grafted word of God with meekness as able to save your soul. But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But also looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. That's what the Lord is telling us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Notice that word again. Doeth continually. Not that, that you did. Doeth. And I'm going, to, I'm going to challenge you. These are the questions I ask myself. Do I still study the Bible like I studied the Bible when I was a younger Christian? I can say, by the grace of God, yes. Do I still read inspiring, motivating Christian literature like I did when I was a younger Christian? And I can say by the grace of God, yes. Do I still search myself every moment and every day to look at what is in my heart today as I used to do many, many years ago? By the grace of God, I can say yes. Am I still longing for God and passionate for God? And running after God, very hard following hard after him. Today, like I did many years ago, by the grace of God, I can say yes. And do I still read my Bible, mark my Bible, even mark verses that I read before. And, you know, just pour over them and, you know, weep over them. Like I did many years ago, by the grace of God, yes. It's, you see, it's not what I did in the past that I rely upon. 
It's not my efforts in the past, consecration in the past, and desire in the past, and prayerfulness in the past that I rely upon till today. Because that's what Jesus requires. It is not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, that shall inherit the kingdom of God, but they that doeth, doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Verse 22, it says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, they know his name, but they don't do his will. Have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have, have, have done many wonderful works? Then will I profess and say unto them, I never knew you. I never knew you. It's not, uh, you know, the wonderful works and the wonderful ministry. It's doing the will of God. I never knew you depart from me. Ye that work iniquity. Revelation chapter 22 verse 14. Revelation chapter 22 verse 14. The, the joy of the Christian, the hope of the Christian is bound in this, that to keep on doing the will of God. Revelation chapter 22 verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Blessed, blessed, happy, fortunate, favored, are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. Think about it. That's what Adam and Eve missed in the garden of Eden. And they were driven out because of their disobedience against the Lord. And the Lord is saying the opportunity is coming again. It's coming again. That what Adam and Eve missed and they lost that opportunity once and for all. The opportunity is available for you and for me. But it is hinged on, the, on doing the will of God. Blessed are they that do his commandments. For they, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. That's the heavenly city. That's the eternal city city and the goal of every Christian is that we will enter into that city uh, you know it's like for example let's say this door here is open and there are treasures in here the treasures we have inside here will give you joy and happiness and fulfillment for the rest of your life and then over there outside uh, before the door, the door is still open. Before they close the door, there is somebody that, uh, you know, is uh, there's a tenera uh, piece. That tenera piece uh, is yours. It fell to the ground. And uh, then you wanted to pick it up. Somebody ran there and picked it up and said, please give me my money. And uh, it says, which money? Which is your money? This ten naira, this one, I'm keeping this one. And you stay there arguing with him, fighting with him, forcing with him. And they're about to close the door. And they're saying, go in going you are hearing they are almost locking the door and the door into the treasure house of god is still is, is still open up but it's about being closed and then because of tenara because of because of argument i will i will not allow that i always fight for my right i always take my right from anybody nobody will ever cheat me going going they're almost locking the door into the treasure house of god and because of ten naira you stay over there until they lock the door against you how wise is that because of these little little things between husband and wife between parents and children, between neighbors and co-tenants, between co-workers, these little, little things are fighting and forcing on that. And then they close the gate to the heavenly city. I will not be foolish. Rise up and tell the Lord, you are going to do the will of God. You are going to obey the Lord. All these little, little things that are pulling you back, all these little, little things that you are concentrating on, and you are forgetting, you are forgetting the reason why you are studying the Bible. You are forgetting the reason why you are coming to the kingdom of God. Why don't you leave all those things and say, Lord, here am I. I give myself to you. Talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, here am I. Here am I. That you will obey the word of God. You will take the word of God. You rely upon the word of God. The Lord has taught us today. You must have the heart to learn. The heart to learn. Ardent love for the truth. You love this truth. You accept this truth. Supreme love for the almighty God. Supreme love. Supreme love. You come to every Bible study every Monday with love in your heart. Intense desire to know more of the Lord. And willingness to make any personal sacrifice in order to learn and to grow. Whatever it requires. 
whatever sacrifice, whatever challenge, whatever difficulty, whatever consecration you are willing to make any personal sacrifice in order to learn, in order to grow. There will be commitment to practice as fast as you learn. You hear it, you go and do it immediately. You hear it, you go and practice immediately. Don't think about yourself. Don't allow pride to keep you away from the kingdom. Don't allow these little, little things. Ten Nara event. Ten Nara argument. Ten Nara stubbornness. Ten Nara self will to keep you away from the kingdom. Be wise. Have a fixed purpose of heart to know and to do the whole truth. Have a state of mind that will not be diverted to make any provision for the flesh. The Lord taught every day and is telling you, follow me, go and do that likewise. Teach somebody every day. That same outline in your hand, take it to your neighborhood, teach them, and lead them to salvation. Take them to your school, teach your students, and teach your fellow students, and lead them to salvation and obedience in the Lord. Early in the morning, you can help those who are not able to come to the Bible story because of night shift. Those who are told me in the morning, as Jesus taught early in the morning, you can teach them to early in the morning. You can teach them in the temple. If the doors of your local church are open to you, you can go in there and teach a friend, and teach a neighbor, and teach a group of young people. We don't have to wait until Monday. We don't have to wait until Tuesday. Any day, every day should be a teaching day. There's no building. A street corner will do. An open air in the community will do. Those of you in the riverine areas who can gather those fishermen together. Go to them on the, on, the, on the shore. And then you can teach them the word of God right there. If you're a rich man, and you have money enough to be able to buy the satellite equipment, you can buy the satellite equipment for those people at the seashore, on the street corner, in a community, anywhere people gather together. You can make this Bible study available to them. Go and do thou likewise. Be a doer of the word. Be a doer of the word. Be a doer of the word. The word of forgiveness. Be a doer of the word. The word of love. Be a doer of the word. What do you hear only? The word of patience and perseverance be a door of the world. The Lord said, go and see no more. New life. For new creatures in Christ be a door of that world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature be a door of the world. Live at peace with all men, be a doer of the word. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, be a doer of the word. 
Let there be holiness between you and those ladies. Between you, lady, and those men. Holiness. Holiness unto the Lord. Be a doer of the word. And you can lean on the promise of God. You can rely on the power of the Lord. God dwells within you. Christ dwells within you. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. The power of the triune God can help you to live victoriously. It's in the doing of the word that we are blessing. Live by the precepts of the word of God. Be a good learner. Be a good learner. Learn the word and obey the word. Build your house upon the rock. Floods will come. Floods will come. And the winds will blow. And the rain will descend. If you don't build your spiritual house upon the rock, you'll be disappointed. That house will collapse. Then you have nothing to show for your being a Christian for all these many years. In a time of temptation, keep on standing. In times of trials, keep on standing. In times of difficulties, keep on standing. In times of provocation, keep on standing. Don't lose eternal life because of ten naira argument. Ten naira claiming my right. Let it go. That a naira is not as important as your eternal life. Let it go. Let it go. Just live for your Lord. Be wise. He that has my, com my commandments and keepeth them. You see that loveth me. I and my father will manifest ourselves unto him. Be not hearers of the word only, but be ye doers of the word. Doers of the word. If the Lord is precious to you, his word will be precious to you. And obedience to the word of God will be your priority and your lifestyle. That's how to prepare to get to heaven. Don't allow all these little, little inconsequential things to take the kingdom away from you. Tell the Lord to give you grace, strength, power, enablement. To live for God. He is able. He will see you through. He will help you to be obedient and to be the man or the woman the Christian you ought to be.